I mean, now we need to, to give it an additional step and implement the remaining uh, kernel-based support vector machine versions. So we can, we can have like a set with all main implementations to proceed with some kernel studies, analysis, and understand when to apply a kernel or a different kernel and so on. So at this stage, I just suggest you guys to go to, to the R uh, statistical software, load a package called E1071, E1071. Inside this package, you guys will found, find a function called SVM. This support vector machine function actually calls the lib SVM, which is the, the main implementation we find in the literature. And actually, it is one of the fastest, fastest implementations we, we can find. If you ask for the manuals of this function, you see how to use it, you can try, but there is something here that I want to show you. That's about the kernels. You guys can see there is a linear kernel, and if you guys set up this variable kernel as linear, it will consider this kernel. That's pretty much the same implementation we wrote together in example 9 over here, linear SVM, this one, that's the same. You know what? I'm going to copy this, copy our implementation and bring to example 10 as linear svn.r. So here we're going to have our implementation. And of course, here we have something like require low rank QP because that's, that's a package we've been using. I'm going to simplify here. And here we're going to have like a linear classify and, and a polynomial classify and so on. So this will be our linear. Actually, it should be SVM linear, so classify linear, just to make, to use the same pattern. Okay. Going back to example nine, we also have our polynomial SVM. So I will copy the polynomial implementation and the polynomial classification. Copy. Going back, and here I will write our polynomial support vector machine implementation. Paste here. Of course, simplify some stuff down here. Of course, simplify some stuff here as well. And here. And instead of, instead of defining as, as polynomial classifier, I use the same pattern. So the pattern is classify dot polynomial. Okay, and here we have our implementation, our polynomial implementation. You know, now we're going to give a next step. Our next step will be we're going to write together the radial basis kernel and the sigmoid basis kernel and of course their corresponding implementations. You can see I just respected the parameters of this implementation. So gamma is multiplied by the dot product plus some coefficient zero as I mentioned to you uh, that's a typical name for some packages and the degree over here. So I will write now the radial basis kernel. So our radial basis kernel, if you go inside this, this should be the radial basis. Let's remove this and remove our sigmoid. That was just to remember what to do in this class. So we're gonna copy the polynomial support vector machine to something called radial support vector machine dot r. Inside our radio support vector machine, I will, of course, change this from polynomial to radio. 
and this from polynomial to radial as well. Okay, of course here we have different a different set of parameters. We only have gamma over here. So instead of degree and coef zero, we only have gamma. And what's going to happen in our matrix? So you might observe that this will be different. <clears throat> Let's comment this. So here we're gonna have something a little different. Instead of computing this y transpose y by some dot product as before, you guys might remember we had some dot product here like this. Uh, of course, considering every example from our set X, if this is a linear kernel, if this is a polynomial kernel, I should employ some degree. If it's homogeneous or heterogeneous, that's going to consider some coefficient. And if we need some change in our uh, scale of the dot products, we employ gamma. Okay. In our case, we need to. I'm going to go back to the simplest kernel we have, which is the linear kernel, which is here. And here we need to come up with a solution. Take a look here. Here we perform the dot product. And here, beside, it's not simply the dot product, but it's actually the distance we have in between every example every u against every example v in our space that's the same as the euclidean distance so i will write here euclidean distance that's the same as euclidean distance and i will call a function called dist if i open here r and you guys ask for the manual of the function dist you see it computes the Euclidean distance by default and it doesn't bring the diagonal, it doesn't bring the upper, uh, the upper side of my, my matrix because it, it is of course asymmetrical matrix in terms of my distance. So let's, let's try uh, one of those examples that were given here. Yeah, like this, I'm just going to copy this. This is an example like Okay, just produce a random matrix with a hundred numbers organized in five rows and compute the difference, the distance, of course, you have from the first against the first, the second against the second, the third against the third element, but just bring the, uh, just half of my matrix because, of course, it's symmetrical, it's a metric, and, but instead of that, if I employ something like as matrix here, it's going to be the full matrix for me. That's the way I want to get it, because that will provide the distance from the first to the first element, as you can see, is zero, the first to the second, the first to the third, and the first up to the, four, the fifth, and the second to all others and third to all others, the fourth to all others and the fifth to all others. You can see it's a symmetric matrix. Take a look. Take a look over here. It's symmetric. Take a look over here. And of course, uh, to five here. It's symmetric. Okay. So this is what I'm going to use with you guys. I will compute the distance of x, but here transforming into a matrix. Because now I've got every possibility of u minus v. Given, of course, uh, this is a distance, I must make it, I must power it to the square. So I will make the Euclidean distance to the square. And of course, so you multiply this by some minus gamma, okay? And then apply the exponential function. 
this will be this operation it will uh, substitute my linear kernel over here so this is my radial basis kernel. if you consider here this gaussian this exponential will bring will just provide me i'm going to open the gino plot here and plot the exponential of some distance x to the square so you guys can see what is going to happen here i have something like this it is a gaussian function around the position zero when i apply some gamma over here let's try like gamma equals to two could be two take a look if i increase gamma i will reduce the spreading of my gaussian if i reduce gamma it will happen the opposite so of course if gamma is half let's consider half I will increase, I will increase in blue here, the spread of my Gaussian. What is zero? Zero is the central point. So every time I consider one as my central point, this is the distance I have to the second, to the third, to the fourth, to the fifth, and that distance will be applied in this function. So I will have a greater relevance closer to one or a small there a small relevance close to zero what is going to happen with this particular matrix over here if i apply the exponential of minus some gamma equals to one and of course this matrix to the square as before we're going to have something like this the point against itself has a relevance equals to 1. However, the point against a very far point is going to be some, somehow really close to 0, 10 to minus 30. The same happens to all the other values, but some of those are closer. Like this is the, this is the closest value we have to the 1 to 1. You know what? What happens if I use like point 0.1? In my gamma, I will increase the relevance I give to the fifth point in comparison to my first point. So there will be some relevance. Of course, the others were also increased. So this is a way of controlling the vicinity I have of my point to give relevance of nearby points. What this is going to build up in my space. It's going to build up some neighborhoods. That's, that's enough for now. That's enough at this point. Of course, in my classify radio, I need to employ something different. I will, oh, something else. I will result, I will just return gamma here, but there is no coefficient, there is no degree here to return. So in my SVM radio, when I I just give it as a parameter of my classify radio. I will compute the same. How can I compute the same? This is something. How can I compute this as, uh, of course, here I'm computing for the polynomial kernel, but now I need to compute for the radio kernel. To compute for the radio kernel, I need to compute every possibility, every distance I have for, from. Uh, x new to every element I have in x. So to x new for every element I have in x. How can I do that? I can use an apply function on x in terms of the rows of x. That's y1. And for every row, I get the row and apply this function. What the function is going to perform is going to compute the difference from that particular example at that particular row to x new. It will compute the Euclidean distance. So I take every particular difference along all the dimensions to the square, sum up, and next I have to apply my square root. 
This is my Euclidean distance. But, of course, in this stage, it is the Euclidean distance of every element against the new element and not against all others because I just have a single new element to be tested in this scenario. Of course, model brings some gamma together to be multiplied by the Euclidean distance to the square. And of course, this is an exponential of a minus gamma multiplied by distance to the square. So here you have, of course, all those results. All those results. Going back to our formulation, we have this. Okay? So this is the way we will, this is actually what we will substitute here. Exactly here. Let's paste. Let's bring this here so you guys can just verify the differences. Take a look. Here we had our polynomial kernel being applied. And instead of this polynomial kernel, we're going to have our radial basis kernel. So I'm going to bring things like this. It's just easier to see what is happening over here. And maybe this beta could be down. Okay. So now we have the way of performing our classification. That's how we're going to perform our classification. This is our kernel in this scenario. We're going to see later what is the impact when this is relevant to be used. Of course, I'm going to write a, a small example with you guys. Uh, yeah, that's all for now. I'm going to go to the next the next support vector machine implementation, which is the sigmoid implementation. Okay. I'm going to copy my polynomial again and create my sigmoid. It's also a sigmoid support vector machine dot R. Open, uh, open up the sigmoid. Of course, instead of being a polynomial, this will be a sigmoid. Okay. Instead of being a polynomial, this will be a sigmoid. There is a very interesting thing about the sigmoid. Of course, it is basically the linear kernel. So instead of considering some degree over here, we just remove the degree. Okay, removed. We remove the degree from here. Okay, removed. We remove the degree as a return parameter. Okay, removed. And you can see we just multiply gamma by the dot product as in here. Okay, plus some coefficient. However, we apply a hyperbolic tangent here. What is the effect of applying hyperbolic tangent? Of course, consider we have the same matrix here, this matrix, x. When I apply the dot product, I will have x product by transposed, x transposed. Oh, sorry, it's in this case, I just called it lowercase x, sorry, my bad. That's my dot product resultant from my linear kernel. Consider my gamma is 1. You consider my coefficient is zero. That's all. When I apply some hyperbolic tangent here, it will make all my results fit in the scale in the range from zero to one. Actually, from minus one to one. Sorry. Of course, I can go to the inner plot and show you if I plot the hyperbolic tangent of a given value x, which is the resultant value inside this term, I will have something like this. All values will be in interval, take a look in my y-axis, from one, from minus one to one. What, what is the effect? 
I'm just saying that if you are on one side of my hyperplane, all answers, all responses to my input will be minus one, and on the other side, all answers will be plus one. That's like creating a hyperplane that every time I have some value uh, in between, of course, greater than minus one and smaller than plus one, I will have some uncertainty because I'm closer, I am nearby the hyperplane. And if I am far from the hyperplane, for, from the positive side, it will be positive one, strictly positive one. If I'm far away to the negative side, it's going to be strictly negative one. And if I am somehow nearby the hyperplane, I'll have some value to consider. That's interesting if you guys are interested in assessing how close you are in terms of the response of your kernel. I mean, close you are, of course, from the hyperplane. Okay? That's my kernel. In this scenario, of course, it will change my kernel over here. So it will not be like this anymore. It will not be like model gamma multiplied by whatever. It will be model gamma multiplied by what? By this product. Yeah, this is the same. Plus some coefficient. Plus some coefficient. Take a look. Plus, oh, sorry, guys. Plus some coefficient over here. Okay, and all that will be transformed by my hyperbolic tangent. So instead of having this polynomial kernel, take a look, I will have something different. I just remove this like this okay? and substitute by my hyperbolic tangent like that. That's my kernel now. And of course, I'll bring it here. This is my sigmoid solution. Let's see if there is something wrong. It looks like I, I forgot closing some, some parentheses, one of those parentheses here. Yeah, this is like parentheses. Yeah, it is closed over here. Of course, here it is closed over there. Oh yeah. Here I need to close my sum and then I add up some beta and return. Yeah, that's all. So now you guys have, of course, oh, sorry guys, this is model dollar. Yeah. So now we have all four main kernels for the support vector machine. What is next? Next, we are going to implement. One example for our radial kernel, another example for our sigmoid kernel, and that's, that's all, okay? See you in the next.